Good morning again. I better put on my timer. I usually preach for 45 minutes, so not today. <laughs> Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the morning. We thank you because every morning you remain our light, our salvation, and our stronghold. And by just pondering about this, it brings confidence into our hearts. Lord, we thank you because there's nothing we do to deserve you. But by your grace, you call us into yourself through Jesus Christ by the Spirit. So Lord, we ask you now to help us to understand your word and to change us with your word so that we may love you more and find confidence in you and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Life can be joyful, isn't it? Someone among us just had a baby. It's worth celebrating. It's joyful. But we also know life can be hard. It is full of battles. Sometimes it even starts in the morning. That pressing anxieties and the fears of the day ahead forces us to fight our way out of the bed. That increasing financial stresses, that constant pain that just wouldn't go away, that ongoing tension at church or in family. And deeper still, it's our struggles of sins, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of other people judging us no matter how hard we try, the fear of doubting God, whether God will ever forsake us. And then we ask, where can we find confidence? Where can we find confidence? And if we take that to another whole new level, imagine we are a king, an ancient king, facing the battle of life and death. You're encamped by enemies. There's no way out. There are constant wars arise against you. There's no breathing space. There are enemies who hate you so much who would literally eat you up. Where can we find confidence? We ask. Psalm 27 is a kingly priest, a kingly psalm. It's a psalm written by King David. Here we see David expressing his great confidence in God. Although it is written against a depressing background of his time, it is not a psalm of desperation. It is a psalm of confidence. So today we're going to look at Psalm 27, and here David is not just showing us where we can find the true confidence, but how comforting and courageous it is when this confidence becomes the longest, the deepest longing of our hearts. And today, through Jesus Christ, we also are given this access into this confidence. So I would like to invite all of us, I don't have any PowerPoint, um, if you could open your Bible and we will follow through Psalm 27. We will trace through Psalm 27 in four sections. First, we're going to look at how David finds confidence in, the God, in God and how this confidence then, second, turns into a desire for God. And then we see how this desire becomes an actual prayer to God. And lastly, we see how in this prayer, the courage of waiting, waiting for our Lord. So we're going to look at confidence in the Lord, and we'll be looking from verse 1 to 3. I shall read from the Bible again. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat out my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamped against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. By just listening to God's word, it warms our heart. 
it warms our hearts. But here we, deep, we go a bit deeper. We see the confidence is based on what David knows about his God. God is his light, is his salvation, is his stronghold. This is who our Lord is. We know darkness is disturbing. Imagine driving around Wishart tonight without any light, not even the street light. It would be chaotic. Nobody knows where to go. Everybody is confused. And if we start driving in the dark, or sometimes living in the dark in our own way, people will get hurt. That could be ourselves, or that could be the loved ones around us. And what's even more scary is that if there's no light, there's no true justice. Everything is relative. So according to the Bible, darkness usually brings disorder, confusion, and eventually evil. We desperately need a light. And thanks be to God, for he is the light. God is the light that dispels confusion, gloom, and despair. Further, he exposes the wicked deeds done in the darkness, whether coming from people or the devil. And even more, he decrees to bring his people out of darkness and into the light through Jesus Christ. And no one, no one can stop God from doing that because God himself is the salvation. And knowing that God is his light and his salvation, David finds the undefeatable, immovable stronghold of his life. And with this, he says, of whom shall I be afraid? The enemies may attack me, criticize me, mock me, or even like Goliath, who sought to literally eat out my flesh. But it is they who will stumble and fall. For my God is strong. My God is my stronghold. You may gather more people, you may gather more army, you may encamp to me, force me into a corner, but my Lord is strong, that my heart shall not fear. You may constantly rise war and charge against me, yet my Lord is again strong, that I will be confident. This is such a powerful proclamation here, my brothers and sisters. So as we come before this text, we can ask, have we ever experienced such confidence like David in our Lord? Is it God who you turn to when you are afraid? Does the knowledge of God in these few verses increase our confidence in him? If David faces life and death, he can still find confidence. We can also find confidence. So are we living in the shadow of darkness today? Take heart, my brothers and sisters. Take heart and say this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And knowing this solid confidence, we turn to the second point. It's the desire for the Lord. David, in verse 4 and 6 to 6, he desires to be where the Lord is. He wants to be where the Lord is. Lord, where are you? I want to be there. It's the desire, the longing for the Lord. Because he sees there's so much confidence in the Lord, he wants to be with the Lord. So let us come back to the text, reading from verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me up high, Upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer his ten sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody 
to the Lord. How joyful! How beautiful it is! In darkness, we hope for light. In distress, we hope for salvation. In battles, we hope for a stronghold, and we know, we know, our Lord can provide all that because He is all that. How beautiful is our Lord! And of course, knowing who He is, we want to be where He is. Even us today, right now, we want to say, God. I want to be with you. And guess what? David says, "Me too." His desire is so strong. He says, "There's only one thing. There's one thing. The one most important thing. It is for me to dwell in the house of the Lord. There is no place more satisfying, no sight more gratifying than living in the very presence of the Lord." Living in the presence of the Lord, this is the one thing I want, and not just one day a week. It's all days of my life. Every morning as I wake up, every evening as I lie down, I want to gaze upon the beauty of our Lord, says David, and to inquire in His temple. Why? Because by coming into the Lord's presence, in verse five, he says, "The Lord." Will shelter me in the day of trouble. God will protect David, and not only that, God will lift him above his enemies to a place of unreachable safety, and to give him personal triumph over the enemies. Beloved, do we know by seeking God's presence, we actually will be lifted up? From a place of uncertainties and vulnerabilities to a place of advantage and strength. Let's imagine we might face enemies on the same level, directly. But as we come and seek Lord to be our stronghold, He will cover us. He will protect us. It's kind of become a little indirect combat. And not only that, David is telling us that he will lift us up, up high, above all enemies. Just imagine looking at the enemies trying to fight you from the bottom of the stronghold while you are up high in the tower. You'll be like, "All the best." It's different. You see, coming to the Lord, we no longer fight the enemies face to face. We are becoming indirect. And then even more indirect, we are up high in the Lord, and that's why David wants to say, "That's one thing. That's one thing I want to do is to come into the presence every day of my Lord. I want to seek Him. I want to know Him. I want Him to be with me. I want to be with Him. So, is this our one thing? Do we desire to live in the Lord's presence every day? You see, my brothers and sisters, waking up does not have to be a battle. Yes, there may be continual struggles, but the best answer to fight fears is not through our own strength, nor through hitting that snooze button every morning on our smartphones. I just did that, but <laughs> but David is teaching us right here: is how do we fight fears? It's through gazing. And inquiring our Lord, it's through gazing and inquiring our Lord, and this is very practical. Very practical. Gazing means to behold. So every day we want to come and see how beautiful our Lord is. We want to know the gracious God who welcomes the weak. We want to see the faithful God who will never forsake us. We want to see the beautiful, the powerful God who is always in charge. We want to see the loving God who sent His Son to die for us, in order that we may be pardoned, despite our daily failure. And the list goes on and on. So have a Bible next to your pillow. If you don't know where to start, try Psalm twenty-seven. Or ask Michael. <laughs> so apart from gazing, 
David is also saying that I want to inquire in the temple. Inquiring means to ask for guidance. Every day, as we step into various kinds of battles, we need guidance, and guidance. And who else can give us better advice or wisdom than our all-knowing, all-wise God? Who else? There's no one else. By His providence and His words, we constantly ask for His direction and His grace, so that we may stay close to that direction. Note this, however, the main point is not to know all the solutions to our issues or troubles, but is to know who God is within the troubles. This is where David finds confidence. He probably can't defeat all enemies. He probably can't fix all problems in his life, but he remains confident, not in the situation not in his own ability, but in the Lord who he knows very well. So he wants to gaze and inquire every day. So this is the Lord who will, we, we should desire. While God is always present, our confidence would only grow experientially by constantly seeking him through his words. As we desire God more and more daily, the more and more we would know how trustworthy our Lord is. And as we trust him more and more, the more we would experience how safe we truly are. As God brings us to safety, we will be like David. We will sing for joy and make melody to our Lord. So let us, every day, desire our God. And now we come to the third part of the text. We pray to the Lord. So far, we have seen that after proclaiming his confidence in, in the Lord, David shows his desire for the Lord. And now, as we turn the attention to verse 7 and 12, we see how this desire, this one thing, develops into a prayer. Like David, we often want to seek God in our prayers, isn't it? We always want to come to our Lord in prayers. But sometimes we might not have the words. We might say, oh, what should I pray about? What do I say? How do I feel? How do I seek God in prayer? So as we go through verse 7 to 12, we will make three observations, and hopefully this will help us to enrich our prayers in the Lord. So we will make three observations, and the first one is the prayer of seeking God is actually a response to a God who invites. The prayer is a response to a God who invites. Verse 7 and 8. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. David prays because God has invited his people, including David, to seek my face. As he quotes Deuteronomy 4, verse 29, he knows that the Lord is always the one who makes the first move. He invites us, we respond. He asks us to seek his face, we seek his face. So prayer is not an endless, random request. It's actually a response to God who has already made the first move by inviting us to come to him. But here's a question. Who would invite an un, a group of unworthy people to receive divine help? Who would do that? We probably wouldn't, but God would. Why? Because God is a gracious God. That's why in the prayer, David said, be gracious to me. So as we come and respond to our God, we say, be gracious to me, O Lord, and answer me. So today, through Christ, God has also made the first move. He graciously invites unworthy people like you and I into himself and to seek his face 
and think about it. When we are in distress, what is more comforting than hearing God says to you, "Seek my face"? What is more beautiful than that, my child? Seek my face. I know what you are going through, but seek my face. I've been gracious to you always, and I will always, always, always do that until the end. So seek my face. So prayer should be a response to God's gracious word, a God who invites. So Lord. I'm in distress, but you have said, "Seek your face." So here I am, seeking you, every day, every moment. This is the first thing we should take away in the prayer. And second, the prayer is a response to a God who does not forsake. It's a response to a God who does not forsake. Verse nine to ten. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O、oh, you who have been help, been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not. For God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. David asks God not to forsake him, for God has been his help. As God invites His people to seek His face, He also, again in Deuteronomy, He promised that He will not forsake or abandon His people. So today, in Christ, God has made even more promises like that throughout New Testament. He will not forsake His children. He will not forsake His sheep, even in our very deep troubles. Is there anything else in creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God?、It's、a familiar passage, and Apostle Paul would say, "What? No, there's nothing will separate us from the love of God." This is a great comfort, my brothers and sisters. Even in the unimaginable situation that our parents may forsake us, God would not. Our prayer, therefore, is a response to a God who does not forsake. And third observation from this prayer is: prayer is a response to a God who guides and protects. It's a response to a God who guides and protects. Eleven and twelve. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. As David alluded previously, that he would inquire the Lord in the temple, he always seek for God's guidance. As we ask God to deliver us out of the darkness, why would we? Walk in the darkness ourselves, but how do we know where's the right path? How do we know we are not walking into the darkness? We don't. Therefore, we ask, and God will lead and teach. So, in our prayer, we often come to God, not just asking Him for comfort, but we also ask Him to lead us in the troubles. Lord, how do I think? How should I think? How should I react to this situation? How do I deal with this person? How do I love this brother or this sister? We ask God for guidance. We ask Him to change us, to lead us not into the dark, but on His path. And also, as David continues to seek guidance, he knows for sure that God will cover him, will lift him up, will protect him. Similarly, in today, we can be confident in the prayer as well, because as we follow God's way, despite all the false witnesses and violence, our Lord Jesus Christ 
is victorious, and God will not give us up to the enemy. We are completely secure in Christ. So here we see the beautiful of the prayer. And the last section, we wait on the Lord. With the strong confidence expressed in his desire and prayer, David now ends the psalm with a strong note of trust. Here in verse 13, he says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Although David continues to face troubles, he remains confident. He remains confident not in the situation or his ability or his power or his army, but the goodness of the Lord. And notice here, David is not focused on the afterlife. His confidence in the Lord is here in the land of living. In the land of living. He trusts that God will remain good towards him while he still lives. So this is a great comfort for all of us. Because Lord, our Lord will not just work for the afterlife, he works right here. But here's a little note. God works in his own timings, not ours. I know we all know that, but we should be reminded again. Because sometimes when we see things, we think they are being delayed. It's actually not, because God has his own timing. And if we trust God, if we truly trust God, we also need to trust his timing. He knows what he's doing. Things may be murky and messy, but David wants us to continue to know that there is such thing called the goodness of God. And this we trust. Therefore, in the last verse, he calls us to what? Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So important, he has to say it twice. Wait for the Lord. I just add one more. Trust comes with waiting. But it is not a waiting in uncertainty and anxiety. It is a waiting filled with courage. If the law of the universe promised to give you a gift, will he not deliver? If the Lord is such a generous father wanting the good for his children, will he not deliver? Therefore, David calls us to wait for the Lord. The Bible asks us to wait for the Lord. And it seems David is trying to say, you can actually rest in the Lord. You don't have to have all the loose ends tied up right now. Wait for the Lord and see his own work. So, beloved, as we conclude, if there is one thing to take away today, that would be this. True Jesus Christ, the Lord of David, is also our Lord today. So the one thing that he seeks for should be our one thing we take away today. The one thing in our lives is to seek God's presence daily. For the Lord is the light, the salvation, the stronghold. And inside this stronghold, we are safe, nothing to be feared. No matter what weapons the enemies might bring against us, the arrows, the siege tower, the catapult, or whatever, we shall not fear. Our Lord is our stronghold of whom we fear. Is it the sting of death? Is it the power of sin? Is it the condemnation of other people or yourself? Is it our own weaknesses? Is it the life circumstances? No, it shouldn't. Because our Lord is victorious. So take heart, my brothers and sisters. We are brought into this stronghold that will never perish. And listen to what Jesus said and promised. My sheep hears my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. It's greater than all. And no one, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. John 10, 27 to 29. Yes, Sometimes we are a bit foolish. We stick our head out of the fortress into the world and get hit by the arrow or stones. But even still, out of his loving kindness, our Lord will call us back 
He will ask us to repent, but even still, he will bring good out of evil. He will continue to grow us, to protect us in his promises. And this is the true confidence that we have. So let us take that one thing today. Let us desire to be with him, pray to him, wait for him, for in him there is no fear. He will carry us through the journey until we reach home. So let us not turn to anything else but to him, our Lord, for he is our light. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and for your word. Lord, we ask you will shape us by your word. Give us comfort for whoever goes through troubles right now or the future, but also strengthen us and give us confidence in you. In Christ we pray. Amen.